Thank you. My name is Howard, and I am an alcoholic. My uh, sobriety date is August the 4th, 1972, which is just about one year after Stan got sober. Um, now, I, after, I, when I first came to AA, I was told by people who had about a year in the program that in August or so of 1971, a great tsunami of spirituality had rolled in to Alcoholics Anonymous and that those people from that time have been trying to bring it to us ever since then. <laughs> and that it has not been easy on them. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Stan and his wife for being such great hosts and hostesses for us. And uh, uh, I want to thank everyone who all was, invite, uh, was involved in inviting me to come and share. I am, as any of us would be, a little intimidated when looking forward to speaking all day uh, about things that we don't always talk about. And um, now, I thought, I, I agree with the voice of the uh, conference that last night's speaker was certainly one of the best talks that I've heard for a long, long time. <laughs> now, having said that, I also want to say I have not heard Patty O or Danny B for a long, long time. I expect them to also give excellent talk. So I'm not going to give as good a talk quality-wise as uh, anybody else that's going to be speaking, but I'm going to give a much longer, <laughs> a much, much longer talk. And I hope that with this tsunami of spirituality that they've been trying to bring into my life, that I can use it to watch the crowd dwindle as the day goes on. I can't imagine me sitting there all day listening to me, I'll tell you that. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. And I am going to talk about some stuff that I don't talk about often. Uh, I'm aware in case, because this happens sometimes when I do talk about some of the things I want to talk about today, I am reminded by people, hey, oh, I also have notes, and uh, I used to carry a stacks of big books and 12 and 12s and, and uh, grapevine articles and, and pass it on, and, and so I took and, and just copied the notes off here. Now, I have people come up and say, Howard, did you ever read Dr. Bob's last talk to the fellowship where he said, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, don't get involved, you know. And uh, yes, I actually have read his last talk where he didn't say that. What he said emphasized the simplicity of our program. And then he said, let's not louse it up with Freudian complexes and things that are interesting to the scientific mind, but have very little to do with our actual AA work. Now that's a lot different than saying, keep it simple, stupid. And uh, uh, I don't think that it was ever Dr. Bob's intention to dumb the program down by not being aware of uh, more things being revealed. And I don't think that that was Bill Wilson's intention either. I also know that they weren't wanting to uh, uh, make things more complex than they actual, actually are. So, I'm um, anyway, during this first talk, I'm going to talk about baby elephant beliefs and how the baby elephant beliefs become part of the root of our problem. And a little bit 
And, and another thing that really intimidates me is I don't know a heck of a lot, technically, about the brain chemistry of the alcoholic or the drug addict compared to the brain chemistry of my wife. But we are different. We are bodily and mentally different from our fellows, and more is being revealed about that with brain scans and that kind of stuff. And it's kind of interesting to me that these studies show that the steps in the given sequence and in the increments described address in the most effective way the brain chemistry and, and uh, bodily and mental disorders that are peculiar to alcoholics and addicts as a class of people. Uh, I don't know, maybe Bill just made that up that way. But then, on the other hand, maybe he was guided. And maybe when he first got sober, he started saying yes to God. And he said yes to God for the rest of his life. Until we had a fellowship of men and women who are here for any alcoholic on the face of the earth who wants to get sober to help them do that. What a wonderful, what a wonderful achievement that is, uh, that Bill Wilson would say yes to God, along with so many other people that have said yes to God over this period of time. Uh, so, I was, uh, I was raised in this, I was born in Los Angeles, California. I, like Paul, have to kind of watch it because I'm speaking again later on and I don't want to use all my material twice, but <laughs> if push comes to shove, I will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I was born in this farm community that we believed was the Bible Belt of the country. It was in the middle of Kansas and and, uh, and then I found out of the people in Oklahoma and the people in Texas and Nebraska and North Dakota and South Dakota, you know, they all think they're in the Bible Belt. So nobody really knows where the Bible Belt is, but I know it buckles about 45 miles southwest of Wichita, Kansas, in this little community that Pat and I were raised in. And, uh, and, uh, in my little town, which was five miles back at this, when, when, in, when I was three or four years old, um, I lived in a town five miles from where Pat lived. And, and we were in competition with Argonia in order to get the farmers in the community to come to Milan to get their hair cut and their shaves and, and uh, use our stores. So we put up, we, I was three or four years old, but. But we put up a free movie for the farmers to come and see. And one of the movies I saw when I was a kid and very much impressed with was a movie on how they train elephants in India. They take the baby elephants out, they put them in a bamboo fence, in a fenced off area, and then they put a rope around their right front leg and they snub them up to a tree. And the baby elephant pulls and tugs and pulls and tugs, cries, tears run down the baby elephant's face. It's a very sad story. But eventually, the baby elephant comes to believe that when that rope is tight, it's futile to pull. And so they go on with the next phase of the training. But all the rest of the training for all the elephant's life, they reinforce that truth that when the rope is around your right front leg and tied around uh, uh, and, and it's secure, uh, then it's futile to pull. And at the end of the movie, they, they had this big elephant. Uh, they'd cut down a tree, trim the limbs off, hook that tree trunk up to the big elephant's harness, and he would pull that tree trunk out of the forest for harvest. And at the break, when they wanted to hold it, lunch break, they drove a relatively short stake deep enough in the ground 
that when they put the rope around the big elephant's right front leg and wrapped the other end of the rope around the stake, it could walk around, but when the rope got tight, it couldn't pull. It, it seemed to be incapable of pulling against the tight rope. Now, it wasn't the stake that held the elephant. It wasn't the rope that held the elephant. What held the elephant was the limiting belief that they had imposed on him about the rope and the stake. And I came to AA <laughs> way down the tubes, and I uh, wasn't at the meeting for very long, and Don Gates was speaking. And I don't remember whether Don was a Republican or a Democrat, but he was a very articulate guy and funny and, and a really a brilliant guy. He, he was saying that whatever he was, let's say he was a Democrat, then he ticked off the reasons that he was a Democrat. And then he, or, or a Republican, whichever the hell he was. And, and, uh, but then he said, actually though, that's not why I'm what I am. I'm what I am because that's what my dad taught me to be. And on the way home, I realized that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous with about 250,902 baby elephant beliefs that I had had imposed on me that, that may or may not have been true, but which I didn't realize was a fundamental part of my life and that it had to be right, and I had to make it right, if I was going to have a sense of well-being. Which, as it turns out, I wasn't going to have as a result of anything I ever did except drink whiskey. I'd get a sense of well-being that way, but, but I could not and did not control things. Uh, and, 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 and this was just part of our culture. Uh, in church, I was taught, nobody said, well, that's not true, but, but I would say nobody said, Howard, you're separate from God. But they said, God's up in heaven behind the pearly gates on the streets of gold, in there with the angels and all of this stuff, and, and uh, there's a bunch of, you know, and the angels are keeping watch over you, and they're taking the bad news upstairs where they've got a whole list of stuff, and God is mad at you. Uh, nobody, you know, I knew that. I don't, you know, th this was a belief that was imposed on me. I remember I was telling Pat, and she said, well, that didn't bother me. But I remember, uh, now, now, I was raised in a Protestant community where, and in a farm community, where we didn't have trained nuns or priests to teach us about what our religious beliefs were or should be. We had housewives and farm wives who would read the Bible and they would, from their baby elephant belief, decide what was right and what, was, uh, what you should believe and what you should do. And in this one Bible lesson, uh, Jesus was being baptized in the Jordan River. Well, I, I didn't understand, maybe still don't, the importance of the baptism, but this was happening, so I knew it was important. And it was so important that the heavens opened, and God said from heaven, behind the pearly gates on the streets of gold, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And then the Holy Spirit appeared as a dove. And then... Mrs. Burkholt said, to my understanding, this is the first time that the Trinity are together in the Bible. Well, all the rest of the time, they're separate. And if they're separate from each other, they're separate from me. And, and that kind of thing was taught to me so that whenever I was in trouble, I knew I had to beseech God up in heaven. And the first time I remember doing that, it was the day before wheat harvest. And it was Sunday morning, 
and we fervently prayed for it not to rain so that the farmers could get their equipment into the fields and harvest the crop. It rained that day, it hailed that day, the wind blew and wiped out the entire Sumner County wheat crop. And while nobody pointed their finger at me, I knew whose fault it was. I knew who wasn't doing what God wanted you to do. And I knew you guys were doing it, and I wasn't. Now, what I didn't know was if you're four or five years old and you've assumed the entire responsibility for wiping out the Kansas wheat crop, <laughs> what you have is an ego problem. <laughs> the old baby elephant belief is I have to behave in such a way that I will find a sense of well-being. And I never got the hang of being haved that way. Never really, I don't think, wanted to. Uh, but uh, so I felt separate from God. Then in this same culture, uh, going to school, they start telling you stuff like evolution like survival of the fittest. Well, that goes against this other stuff that you're being talked about or taught. And, and, and so we're getting into what could be characterized as competition. Competition is the greatest thing that happened in my culture since sliced bread. I had to become the best better than Roger Bruton, <laughs> who was way the hell smarter than me and probably still is. Uh, and he knew these ABCs and he could count to a million before we even started the first grade. And I was in competition with him and I didn't know, I couldn't count past 10. So I was in competition. And, and there was no way I could catch up, but there's no way I could say. I can't catch up. And I had to do it myself. I had to be like the little train that could. I think I can, I think I can, I know I can, I know I can, you know, when I knew I couldn't. But I had to, to win the competition. Now, that's a good thing, I'm convinced today, for let's say 90% of the people. But about 10 to 15% of the people have a different brain chemistry than Pat had. This whole culture worked wonderfully for Pat. We were in the same class from the seventh grade on through till we graduated together, and she was the most popular person in town, in the church, in the school, every place. She poured tea in the governor's mansion during some part of our high school, and. I mean, she just always got to do all this great stuff, and which meant she wasn't going to have anything to do with me uh, because I was in trouble all the time. And I was deeply in love with her. My life was empty without her, but it was empty because she wasn't going to have anything to do with me. And uh, uh, in our lifetime together, which after we got married. We got married September 22nd, 1953, so we've been married over 60 years during that period of time. And even before that, she had never drank. Now, she would have a drink, but she had never drank. And one time, she got drunk. And, uh, and she ended up on the floor uh, in the bathroom with her I'm sure she was married to the porcelain throne. And uh, when she got up and got out, she said, I, I don't know why you do that, but I'm never going to do it again. And she didn't. Only one time in 60 years did she. Now, why is that? <laughs> I know, I know. We, it's, it's how it works. It's not why it works. But it doesn't hurt me. Now, I stayed sober for 35 years and never had 
Uh, I'd never heard of anything called no epinephrine or dopamine or serotonin, anything, just never heard of it. But when I was 35 years sober, I did a men's retreat with a doctor who specializes in that, and he had, he had brain scans that show the activity in the fight or flight center of alcoholics that are just much more active in terms of the brightness of the color than the non-alcoholic. Uh, Pat's little brain must be, you know, it's, it's, it is not as active in the fight or flight center. You see, and, and the alcoholic is a class of people our, that, that part of our brain is in, the, say, the top 15% in terms of abundance of the neural transmitters that activate the fight or flight center. And we're in the bottom 50% as far as the neural transmitters uh, called dopamine and serotonin, which work synergistically to activate the pleasure center. Which isn't a bad thing if you're a cave person and you're on the alert for a grizzly bear. <laughs> I mean, the last thing you want when you're struggling with the grizzly bear is to have a pleasant feeling. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you just don't want that. Uh, God don't even want, I know, God don't even want you to feel good fighting a grizzly bear. What you need if you're gonna fight a grizzly bear is to pump more adrenaline, steroids, oxygen into your system so that you have more strength to flee the grizzly bear or to fight the grizzly bear. And if you're like me at all, you cannot always differentiate a grizzly bear from what my ego wants. And then I'm afraid I am not going to get. Uh, I'm afraid of it, or by God, I'm mad enough that I'm going to get it. And when I was 13 years old, I drank about a half of a half a pint of whiskey. And I, uh, I felt good. The old plate, you know. But what happens is, alcohol is an aliphatic sedative. There's a bunch of them uh, that, that we're, we're all cross-addicted to, but alcohol is the main drain here. And, and it sedates the transmitters that pump norepinephrine to the fight center. So, and and it, it does in a manner analogous to burning the transmitter numb. Now the burn happens as soon as you drink the booze, but so does the numbness, and the numbness is more intense than the burn. So the numbness stops the pumping and the pleasure center kicks in. You're no longer anxious. You're no longer full of fear and anger. Uh, you have a sense of well-being. You know, and that will last for about two hours. Then it stops being numb and the burn kicks in. And uh, it's called a hangover. And you're more agitated now than you were before you took your first drink. But Danny and I were smart enough very quickly to, well, as soon as that happens, drink some more. <laughs> and you just, you just get through there, and then you drink some more. And over the long haul, you're drinking a lot. And when you're doing that, the burn is getting worse on your nervous system until finally it takes more and more sedative, more, and not, you cannot get enough sedative to stop the agitation. So then you find somebody that sells little white pills with crosses on them or some other thing that you can combine. You know, as Dr. Dr. Bob and Bill both did, they both found things to combine with their alcohol in order to make this thing keep working. And, uh, and, and life gets tough. Uh, and and uh, your, wife, <laughs> your wife gets mad at you and uh, 
Uh, and so uh, I got us in debt. You know, it seemed to me like when I first started drinking, I felt good every time I drank. I don't remember ever when I first started drinking not getting drunk if I could. I always, you know, now I, that doesn't mean I become a heavy drinker. It just means that once I started to drink, I was going to get drunk before I got stopped. I was going to, and then I was going to throw up. Uh, but you see, the difference between Pat and I, without any understanding at all about this, but let's just imagine that zero, from a scale zero to ten, zero is the worst feeling you can have. Ten is the best feeling you can have. And I would estimate, now she and I have talked about this, and she thinks maybe I'm a little low on my estimate, but she lived her life at about a six and a half. Okay? I'm pretty sure I never got much over a three and a half. So I'm going through life, and the best I felt was a sense of low-grade alert that everything's all right now, but something bad is going to happen. I mean, I never had anything like a sense of ongoing well-being, not even close. She went along at a six and a half and, and happy as a lark, except with me. And uh, when she drank whiskey, she went from a six and a half or a seven to an eight. And when the burn, when the numbness wore off, she went to a two and a half. And when she came out of there, she said, I'm not ever going to drink again. She didn't say this or know it, but a reward of one and a half up does not justify going down to a two and a half. Now me, I'm stringing along here to three and a half and I go to an eight. It's a whole new life. <laughs> and so I drop down to a two and a half. <laughs> you know, who cares? <laughs> well, I care. I'm not going to do this again, but I'm going for the eight. <laughs> you know, I, and, and boy, that happens that happens very quickly, and if you research the thing, there's explanations for, you know, like, like one of the explanations you'll find is a post, in a post-hypnotic, you ever seen a hypnotist and seen this thing, and, and they give them a post-hypnotic suggestion while they're, while they're hypnotized. Then afterwards, let's say he said, uh, ten minutes after you come out of this trance, you're not going to remember me saying this, but I want you to open the window. Just go over there and open the window. It's not but five degrees above zero out there, and it's colder than hell in here the way it is, but open the window. And ten minutes after, he gets up and opens the window. And the guy says, why did you do that? This is my office. Well, he starts making up explanations. It was too hot in here, you know. He does just what we do when they say, why did you get drunk? Well, I make stuff up. There's got to be some reason. But the fact is, I've got something in my brain that is driving my actions that my conscious mind is not capable of grasping. And, uh, and as soon as I went from a three and a half to an eight, <laughs> that went on without my conscious mind being able to grasp it. But I was going for it again. And you just keep going, you know. It, it be, you know and it's more than an addiction, you see. If, if we give Pat, if we give Pat, I don't know how in the hell we could do this, but if we give her a pint of whiskey to drink today and she'll drink it, and a pint tomorrow, and a pint the next day, and a pint, let's say, every day for 30 days, and on the 31st day we wouldn't give her anything, on the 32nd day she would start to have a withdrawal alcohol addiction. She would be addicted to alcohol 
But she is not an alcoholic because she runs, she, I mean, her brain chemistry and, and, and brain function goes back to normal. Ours goes back to our normal. And so we remain addicted any time we keep drinking. If we don't take that first drink and if we work the steps, if we stop drinking, stop destroying our nervous system, to the point, to the point, now this happened to me. Pat and I, it was, uh, I wasn't sleeping good then, but, but uh, I woke up and there was just barely enough light to see a tarantula spider hanging from a web from our ceiling. And I'm bright enough to know that tarantulas don't have webs they're ground spiders, but this one had a web. And just when I closed my eyes, the web broke. And I saw the web break. And I just closed my eyes. And then the tarantula hit my pillow. I heard it. And I come up out of there. And she said, what's the matter? What's the matter? I said, nothing. <laughs> now, years later, I see that our... Our nervous system gets so damaged that it provides input of, of sensual input of stuff that's not there. Some of you listen to music that is, you know, or some of us see things, but, but uh, uh, we need this, you know, we, we, when we stop drinking, we stop tearing our nervous systems up. And gradually, in that period of time, we get to feeling better. And if also during that period of time, we learn to help set up the tables and chairs for the meetings and do a little service for someone else, somehow or other, that little bit of service lets the pleasure center work just a little bit. And then you lower the damage to your brain, uh, and and then you come in and you start going to meetings. I remember I uh, I'm, I'm going to tell that stuff later, but uh, <laughs> probably this morning. But but uh, uh, I was uh, hopelessly in debt, and uh, uh, I'd stolen some equipment, uh, you know, and and. Uh, you don't have to be very bright when you read the steps and read just chapter five in the book and just look at it, you'll see that we're supposed to make a list of the stuff we've done, like where we've been dishonest, like where we've stolen stuff. Well, I ain't going to do that. And then you're going to tell that to somebody. And worse than that, you're going to give it back. I ain't going to do any of that. <laughs> I am not going to do that. That's why I'm here. I'm here to hide out until this stuff blows over. <laughs> you know, I, I uh, sponsored this guy who called me, and he, he, he asked me a long time ago what I thought about psychiatry or psychology. And I said, well, I'm sure that it's helpful, but it was never helpful to me. And, and he called me the other day and said, well, I'm going to give up on the psychology. I'm through throwing rocks at the beehive. Uh, <laughs> but that, you know, my, my beehive was very active. And, and uh, uh, so, but I, I, I tell you, I didn't want to drink. And I didn't drink and I didn't take drugs. And I said to my, the guy that brought me to AA, um, if, uh, if I don't believe God's in my life, and if I don't plan to work the steps, I'm not going to work the steps, can I be an AA member? Well, of course you can. If you say you are, you are. Yeah, but can I have a program? Yes, you can have a program. What would my program be? Well, let's just start out with your program being you're going to go to a meeting every night. Is that all? That's it. 
He said, I'll go with you for the first 30 days. We'll go 30 and 30. You see, the reason that they stay with you is so they can start new baby elephant beliefs. <laughs> and on the way to the meeting, he says, now, what we do in the meetings is just listen to what people say. That's it. We just listen to why well, that is that. Well, hell, that's what we do in all the meetings. Well, he said, now, you listen, and if somebody says something that sounds good to you that you think will help in your life, then you take that home and add that to your program, and you start using that in your life. I heard some profound stuff. Profound. Now, I knew about deep thinking because in my bar, <laughs> let me tell you about my bar, <laughs> called the Tattletail Lounge. <laughs> and it's on the corner of Sawtail and Sepulveda in Culver City. This year, some restaurant guide listed the Tattletail Bar, the Tattletail Lounge, as one of the top eight dive bars <laughs> in all of Los Angeles. <laughs> I didn't just come out of any pond scum bar. <laughs> I came out of one of the top eight. I sent that to Clancy. I just, I don't know why, I was moved to send it to Clancy. And I said, I'm trying to be humble, Clancy, but <laughs> this just overwhelms me with pride. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't sent each other a lot of emails, and I didn't get an answer for three or four days, and he said, Howard, I'm just stunned by this email you sent me. I have let my, all of my other emails go unanswered. I don't talk to my sponsees on the phone anymore. <laughs> I'm just working on how to respond. <laughs> he said, I have worked for years to make the nut house in Texas that I came out of some kind of an iconic thing. But he said, you have done that with the tattletale. <laughs> And in our Pond Scum Bar, <laughs> we were deep thinkers. <laughs> By deep thinkers, somebody at the bar said to the bartender, nothing is as easy as it looks. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong, and at the worst possible time. He said, that's Murphy's Law. I said, give me a pencil and paper. Say that again. I mean, <laughs> this is the fundamental truth about all of life. Everything you do, nothing is as easy as it looks. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong at the worst possible time. Now, actually, and I had had some statistics, I'm sure others here have had, statistical classes. And what you're taught in statistics is that the extremes are the least likely to occur. Whatever the extreme is, it is less. Now, my mind always assumes that the worst possible event is going to manifest from what's going on, and that that has the greatest likelihood of happening. No wonder you drink. <laughs> and then you, <laughs> you sit there and you hear somebody say, life sucks, and then you die. <laughs> Put that on the bulletin board up there with Murphy's Law, you know. <laughs> Don't trust anybody. <laughs> Put that up there. And uh, <laughs> these are all baby elephant beliefs. These are old, old ideas that fit in your belief system. Those things fit in your belief system. And I come in my first meeting, on the second half of the meeting, it was about God, and uh, they read on page 93, 
I just make up page numbers. <laughs> it, adds, it adds credibility <laughs> to your talk. If you say, well, on page 93, it says, to emphasize to the new people, whatever God you believe in will work for you, provided it makes sense to you. Well, I, I remember that. That was a, a, a kind of a transforming thing for me because there were many things I believed in the religious teachings in the baby elephant beliefs that I had uh, about God and religion. I had, at one point in time, uh, uh, become an atheist. Now, there's a little story there. Uh, I was in love with Pat, and uh, she wouldn't have anything to do with me. And I came home in my, for my dad's funeral, and her and her fiancé, and me, and, and this girl that, anyway, <laughs> they took us out. Uh, and, uh, and we parked, and, and uh, I thought, boy, I'm not ever going to come home again. This is it for me. And... Uh, I uh, we went back, and then Pat got split up from this guy, and as soon as she got split up, I heard about it. And I went home to tell her that I loved her, that I've always loved her, that my life is empty without her. I'm not proposing or anything. I'm just saying I want you to know that because <laughs> I was told there were losers. That's the guy that will tell them, and she says, no, I ain't going to have anything to do with you. But loser, loser is the one who won't tell her. And I wasn't going to be a loser, loser. And uh, I went back into uh, my life in the Navy where I had a mentor there who had changed my, I had no idea how much he was changing my life. Uh, he saw much more than me in me than anybody else ever had. And he was my mentor in electricity and in life. And he was a Catholic and I was a Protestant. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm going to be a Catholic. <laughs> and uh, so I started taking instruction. That's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> you know, they know. Now, most of us Protestants grow up thinking the Immaculate Conception. Now, that's important stuff, the Immaculate Conception. Well, what I came away believing was that Mary got pregnant and that Jesus was conceived through the Holy Spirit and that that was the Immaculate Conception. Well, the Immaculate Conception isn't really part of the Bible. It is an edict from, I think, Pope Pius IX, two or three hundred years ago, who saw in the church's eyes that Eve had dropped the ball right off the bat <laughs> and that Mary was blessed from the very beginning and uh, uh, held in high esteem by God because she was going to be the father of his child. And the Pope's edict was, therefore, that Mary must be born free of the stain of original sin. Therefore, when St. Anne got pregnant and Mary was conceived, that was the Immaculate Conception. She was born free. Now, you, you, you know, the Catholics teach that, and, and you don't pick it up. Uh, a lot of the Catholics don't. But anyway, <laughs> I, and, and, you know, uh, why? <laughs> you know, who cares? But uh, <laughs> a lot of people do, and if they do, they should. But I had a lot of conflict, and it made sense to me that if I can find a higher power that makes sense to me, here, if that's possible, that's the way I'm going to approach it. But I ain't going to do the steps to do that. <laughs> you know. And then we had a guy in my home group named Leo H. 
And this was in Culver City, California. We have a Leo in Phoenix who passed away. And, and when I started telling this story, I got a lot. Leo from Phoenix got a lot of stuff. Uh, and it wasn't him. It was Leo H. in Culver City who was the two-stepper. He worked the first step and the 13th step. No, the 12th step. And uh, <laughs> probably the 13th too. But, but uh, And he would say in the meetings, if, you, if somebody talked about the fourth step, he would say, and he'd finally call him, he'd say, I just want to say to the newcomers, stay away from that fourth step. It'll get you drunk quicker than anything we could do to you. And uh, I, that sounded good to me. Because I was staying away from it anyway, and for good reason. And so if, if it worked for Leo and it worked for me, I'm going to have the first step and the 12th step. That's it. And I started setting up a tables and chairs and, and uh, doing a lot of stuff that gave me a sense of well-being and going home and fighting with Pat didn't. So I just spent more and more time setting up tables and chairs and going home and fighting with Pat about setting up tables and chairs and, and when the hell's it going to be my turn and, and uh, you know, th things aren't getting any better here. Uh, oh yes they are, I'm setting up tables and chairs and making coffee and, and cleaning up and, and this is, you know, but it's not really helping me. I mean of course it's helping me, I know that. But I got trouble right there in River City. And, uh, and, and so I thought, well, I'm going to start working the 10th step, too. I'm going to work the first step, the 12th step, and the 10th step in order to just start right now, not causing trouble and doing, the, you know, doing this stuff now. And eventually, this is going to be a longer period of time than the other, and we'll just ignore this other. Uh, now, does that make sense? <laughs> Damn right that makes sense. <laughs> Everything you believe <laughs> that makes sense don't work. <laughs> I mean, I hate to, can I, you know, but everything in the big book, as I got it, didn't always pan out. And, uh, but one of the things that did pan out is the steps work in the numerical sequence that they're written in. And while you can get some benefit, great benefit, it is only when they're in the right sequence that they become an unshakable foundation for life. Then we have a way to go. It takes, it seemingly, forever <laughs> to really get there. Because when you think you really are there, then everything changes. And nothing was the way you were sure God wanted it to be for you. And it takes a little while to disengage from this. But ultimately, well, I'm not ultimate yet, but I'm going to talk to the tsunami of spirituality uh, from 71 and, and see at what, at what period of time do you stop getting distracted from God? Because I'm not there yet. Uh, but the steps address the brain chemistry. Let's just say we are spring-loaded to be angry and frightened. That that part of our brain is oh, it's not overstimulated. It's just overstimulated when compared to our pleasure center. So that when you win the competition, when you become the best or the boss, you don't just surrender and let the praise you come. You're ready to fight. You know, like like Vince Lombardi told his team after they won. Well, the first Super Bowl, now you guys are the best. Make it be whoever becomes the best that they become better than you are now. I don't want you to deteriorate and be best. I want the competition to make them better. Well, that's, that's stuff, man. That was the stuff I heard all my life. 
So I'm always ready to fight. And, uh, and I, the pleasure center never kicks in until I drink whiskey. And then it just two hours, you know, at the most. I, I've heard people talk about eight minutes. Uh, and I know I've thrown up in eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but whiskey worked. And then whiskey and benzene, a whole bunch of stuff worked. And uh, I come in here and they say, stop all that. Just stop drinking and stop using. Set up the tables and chairs. And I don't know what there is about setting up tables and chairs. But I, you know, the, the other night, Wednesday night, I was at a, a, a meeting in my home group. It's a beginner's meeting. And we've got probably 50 young people there from 12 step houses through the area that come to our beginner's meeting. And this one gal that sat next to me uh, has about a year and a half sobriety, and she's the old time, one of the old timers among these young people. And we're, we're talking about the, uh, we had read We Agnostics from uh, uh, page 44 to, to the top of 48. And uh, <laughs> and when and they drew we, we have a ticket thing and, and they pulled her ticket and she said uh, you know I've been sober a year and a half and I have a sponsor and we work the steps and we do this stuff and she said it just goes along and it doesn't work and then something happens and I can't explain to you what happened. But something happened, and I felt completely different. I just felt different. And then about five times in the rest of her minute and a half share, she said, it's something I don't understand. I cannot explain it. I don't understand it. You know, exactly. That's profound. If something happens, you can't complain. What you've had is a spiritual experience, <laughs> which our minds cannot penetrate. It isn't an intellectual exercise. You're not saying, oh, I'm shutting off the no epinephrine and activating the dopamine. You know, that's, that is intellectual understanding, which isn't that bad, and that's a baby elephant belief we're taught to have so that I can be smarter than you in the competition. And uh, uh, so we come in and we just start doing this stuff and then things start happening which we cannot explain. And we become less angry and less frightened with a greater sense of happiness and a and, uh, uh, sense of well-being, just gradually. Nobody's going to come in generally. It happened to Bill Wilson. Most of us, it ain't going to happen to that we're going to go from a three and a half to an eight sober without doing anything else except showing up in the hospital. But God needed that to happen to Bill Wilson so he could keep saying yes to what he had in mind for him. Uh, God had been very slow with me because I've been very slow with God. I was nine years sober before I was ready to believe that God was in my life. I believed in God, but he was off creating other universes uh, or something because he wasn't helping me except my life was working wonderfully. Things were happening, but I couldn't explain it, didn't understand it, therefore it must not be right. Uh, we got a whole, I have a whole universe of things that I, you know, and the book just has simple ass statements in it, like we have to give up our old ideas. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just give up all of them at once? Wouldn't that be good? Uh, that hasn't been my experience. I have gone from 
a three and a half to a four, back to a three and and three quarters, then to a four and a half, and then back to a four, and then up to a five, and back to a damn three again. And um, but these are changes that shut off. Okay, if you make a list of all the people that you resent and you actually forgive them, each one of those represents shutting off a certain number of transmitters that activate the fight or flight center. Those things get shut down. And the pleasure center has a better chance of opening up. Each of these things in the steps address our bodily and mental differences from our fellows. And as long as we stay here, my observation, and I haven't checked this with my senior over here, Stan, <laughs> but my observation is if you stop doing, stop doing stuff and start cutting corners, which I know I have done, start cutting corners, uh, then pretty soon you can be right back where you were. You know, the pumps start, you, you never lose the pumps, it don't look like. And if you don't do the things that keep them shut down, then they're going to start back up again and it's fight or flight, it's win the competition, I have to be right here. And uh, that, but as, if we just keep this other thing going. Uh, I think in the face of my lovely wife having three strokes since August uh, 2012 and going blind, we have had over that period of time some of the best times and best parts of our 60 years together. Why? Because we looked for the best part instead of looking for what the hell we didn't want. Not much was happening that we wanted to happen without us wanting to find the goodness in what was happening. That takes, you know, that's just a miracle to me. Uh, uh, Paul last night mentioned what's a miracle. Well, to me, that's a miracle. That's a wonderful thing. So I'm going to stop just to give you some optimism that I stopped a few minutes before the whistle blows. And, uh, and then the rest of the talk is more interesting than this part. <laughs> Trust me on that. I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, so far, I don't know, you know, we'll see. But so far, we're not aware of any pearls of <laughs> wisdom, but uh, uh, I was talking to Kay, who I think got sober in 67, uh, and, she, and she mentioned Dr. Bob again, uh, and, and the, the fact that she has been interested in the biochemistry from when she first got sober. And I know in 1968, before I was here, but she was here, uh, Dr. Stanley Gitlow prepared an article in the old grapevine called The Pharmacological Approach to Alcoholism. And it's just a super uh, technical, review of the pharmacological aspects of alcoholism. But I'm not sure what month that that grapevine was in. But anyway, back to Dr. Bob. Now remember, he said, let's don't get involved with the Freudian complexes. No news to any of us here, Dr. Bob was a medical doctor. Sigmund Freud was a medical doctor. 
I'm sure Dr. Bob was familiar with Sigmund Freud and some of his beliefs and teachings. One of which, if you look it up in your internet today, is that Sigmund Freud believed in the development that sometimes we get hooked up in incestual desires for our opposite parent, which, Freud argued, leads to a fundamental habituation called masturbation, and that a spin-off habituation is alcohol habituation. Need Dr. Bob say more? <laughs> then let's not get involved <laughs> in these Freudian complexes. Oh, he also proposed that the most effective treatment, uh, Sigmund Freud proposed that the most effective treatment for alcoholism and alcohol habituation was cocaine. <laughs> There's been a time in my life when I would have endorsed that, but I never, I never used cocaine, but I never, I never got that bad. Uh, <laughs> So I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I went to meetings, and I listened. I did listen, and I got some great laughs. I heard Flo D talk when I was brand new, and she was colorful, but, but just a delightful person. Uh, and I, I called to talk to her to get her to speak the first time I could get a speaker, and she said, oh, honey, I just don't feel like it tonight. Will you call me some other time? And then she passed away in just a few days. She was, she was suffering from cancer. But uh, she said that she met, she said her first husband chased her, or she chased him into the church and caught him by the organ. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she said when uh, <laughs> when she when he proposed to her it surprised her so much that she fell out of bed. Uh, <laughs> but my favorite Flo D story was when she had fallen and broken her arm and then she had shingles. And I have had shingles. It is just excruciatingly painful. And she did the right thing. She sat on the foot of her bed at 3 o'clock in the morning in great pain and shook her fist in God's face and said, why me? And a booming voice came to her and said, because, Flo, there's something about you that pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I know you got to be sick for that to help you, but <laughs> that was a big help to me with God. If, if somebody's God would say that, then I was in the right place. Uh, so I came and I heard somebody say, if you make one mistake and brood about making the mistake, you made two mistakes. And the brooding is frequently the worst consequence of the mistake. Well, I got that. Isn't that profound? Isn't that so simple but profound? And I took that home with me to add it to my program. <laughs> and um, I brooded about not being able to stop brooding. You know, I just couldn't do that. Ski from San Diego said, I was 36 years in learning that all the people that I hated didn't feel the hate, and it was killing me. Profound. I took that home to hate Ski for saying that. <laughs> I went to the Malibu, well, I, 
I told this story to Stan, and and uh, I'm going to tell it because Vicky and uh, Danny are here. But but I was pushing the lawn mower in my right, mowing the lawn, and it hit a tree root. And it was an old lawn mower. Everything we had was outdated, and uh, the 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 reel hit a, a tree root, and the lawn mower stopped, and I hit it with my chest bone right there where the bolt holds the handle on. It hurt. You want to test it out, hit yourself with the ball peen hammer about that hard. And, and man, I said, damn Pat, anyway. <laughs> she wasn't even home. But whenever anything went wrong, that was always damn Pat, you know. And then I said, damn AA, too. AA don't work. If AA worked, would my chest hurt? I don't think so. Pretty much AA's fault. I'm not going to AA anymore. I'm not going to drink, but I'm not going to AA. But when it came time that Saturday night to go to the meeting, I forgot that I wasn't going. And Clarence, who always took me to the meeting in Malibu, picked me up, and on the way to the meeting, uh, I'm thinking about how wonderful everything is. And <clears throat> I get there, and Jack Bailey, who Jack Bailey was always nice to me, and uh, he was the guy that was the MC for Queen for a day, and a wonderful, wonderful. If you ever saw him or heard him on the radio, where he lifts. These people's spirits up that are just downtrodden and out. He does that with newcomers like nobody ever has. I mean, he would lift you up. And, and, uh, and then Don Gates was the speaker again. And he said, well, if you're new or if you're old in AA and you're not working the steps, AA will stop being fun. And you'll decide AA doesn't work for you. You're not going to drink, but you're not going to go to those AA meetings anymore. He said, you don't go to the AA meeting for a while, then you'll go to the bar and order a drink. And when uh, <coughs> the bartender said, what's the matter? I thought you was going to AA. Don't AA work? He said, if you're not working the step, tell him you don't know if AA works or not because you weren't trying AA. Now, my head popped off at everything. From the very first, uh, remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. I got that. Alcohol does not have a brain, therefore cannot be cunning. Cunning requires an intellect. You see, they got that wrong. I mean, that's the way my head worked all the time. I was constantly invalidating whatever was coming up. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. Hey, if you're going to give alcohol power, cunning, baffling, powerful, then you can't give God all power. There's just all power to give. And if you give it all to God, you can't give any to alcohol. See, you got that screwed up too. It's amazing how I could sit there and just screw up my life and once in a while hear something. And, but I heard that, and I knew that I could, not, I could not think the program wouldn't work for me unless I would work the steps. Now, looking back, I can see I came. I was coming to meetings, I was setting up tables and chairs. I was meeting the most wonderful people in the world. The first guy I met was Frank G, who was my sponsor sponsor, and Frank was retired. And I couldn't get my sponsor during the day when I was having anxiety attacks. And I could get Frank, and I would call Frank, and, and he would talk me down, you know, just say, well, you're a statistician, I mean, you're an engineer, what's the chances of that happening? Uh, and, and can it really be that bad? Are you going to be able to survive? But anyway, he talked me down from anxiety. And this time, I had 
a problem. And I called Frank, and he said, and when I told him what the problem was, he said, hey, I think you finally found a problem. I think that's a real problem. And I said, Frank, I didn't call to hear that. <laughs> I called you to talk me down. Well, he said, I'll tell you, I won't do that, but I'll tell you what I will do. I'll say the serenity prayer with you. Frank, I'm looking for a real answer here. It's not, it's not like no rain at harvest time. This is a real problem. And uh, he said, you called me. Didn't you call me? I said, yes. And he said, well, I, I'll say the serenity prayer with you. And uh, we said the serenity prayer, and I kind of listened to the prayer. Not only did I say the words, I kind of listened to it. And I just kind of accepted what was going on, and, uh, and I had a sense of well-being. And uh, talked to him about that a little later, and I, and, uh, I said, you know, it was like spinning plates. I saw a juggler spinning plates on the tops of sticks, and when he got to the fifth one, the first one was starting to fall. He had to go back and get it going, and, and then when he, then he got the sixth, he had to go back and get the, I said, that's the way my whole life is. And he said, why don't you let the plates fall? <laughs> well, that's easy for you to say. Well, he said, uh, you're an engineer. You have to know that there's a lip on the bottom of that plate that interlocks with the stick by inducing centrifugal force. And that's what keeps this plate up there. All of the anxiety, all of the body motions, all you can put into it with, with your uptightness has zero to do with the plate staying up there. And uh, the guy just was, a, you know, just a hell of a help to me. And uh, he took me to central office to answer the phones with him. I remember the first time, Pat, I came home, I was, I was in my first few days, actually, of sobriety, and I come home, and I don't know why she was still mad at me. I hadn't had a drop to drink all week. I mean, <laughs> I had been sober once for a week and got drunk and stayed drunk for a week, and now I'm sober again. What the hell is she mad about? And uh, so I just left. It was Friday night, and I came home, and, and uh, right after dinner, I went to the meeting. And Frank hadn't even started putting up the tables and chairs yet. And he couldn't get the lights on. And he was working in a pan, an electrical panel, trying to get the lights on. And I thought, well, somebody's going to have to put, the, I'll, I'll help put up. These were the heaviest tables known to man. I don't know who decided to make tables out of lead. <laughs> but these, and I thought, that old guy is 63 years old. How, why in the hell is he having to put up these tables? And, and uh, so n nobody in AA amounts to a hell of beans except Frank. And, and I'm putting the tables and chairs up. And by the time I get them up, he's got the lights on. And, and, uh, and we're, uh, uh, we have our meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he's the secretary. That's why he's putting up the tables and chairs. And he don't get even. He's retired, and he can do all this stuff himself. And, and anyway, at the end, he looked me right in the eye. And I knew he was going to thank me for putting up the tables and chairs. So I nearly stood up and said, now be quiet, folks. Let's listen to Frank. <laughs> he looked me right in the eye now. And then he changed and looked out to the group and said, I know God will manifest everything I believe in, and I really believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we did the Lord's Prayer. And I'm pissed, you know. <laughs> he had his chance, and, and, and so afterwards, after we, everybody pitched in and put the tables and chairs up, 
Frank came over and said, I'm sorry, Howard, I, and I thought he was going to apologize for not. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, Howard, I almost blew it for you. And I said, what you talking about? And he said, I almost thank you from the podium for putting up the tables and chairs. And then I realized you'd want to do that anonymously. <laughs> I, <laughs> I did not want to do it anonymously. <laughs> but I got it. You see, it was one of those things that happens that you can't explain. That just kind of lifts you. And Frank did that. Jack Bailey did that. I'm, you know, I've got more longer-term sobriety than those guys did when they were doing that. And I don't do that. That you know, I need to be more conscious. I need to be more conscious in the meetings that when I'm given a chance to share, particularly now, because in at my in my home group and in my they, there's a ton of kids. You know, people that are, are really in their t they're teenagers, and and uh, we we got college people, but but man, these guys are on everything, <laughs> and and they they smoke powder, I think, you know, just women's face powder. They uh, <laughs> got <laughs> they have a spice house. It's uh, Now, I heard this young kid who was 16 years old at my home group before the meeting. He said, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or not. Now, I know his story, and he's an alcoholic. <laughs> he said, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or not, but I love to play hockey. And my drinking and using is screwing up my hockey game. And so I'm going to stop drinking and, and I and using and I can't do it unless I come to the meeting. But he said, uh, uh, I, I have that trouble and so until at least I get out of school and get through his hockey, I'm not going to drink or use. Well, uh, when I and Pat were in school, I went out for every sport. I wasn't a great but I was a hard worker, and I went out for everything. And I generally made the first team. And so the girls get to elect what they call an athletic king for the four years when uh, every, every year they generally pick somebody who's a senior. And the girls elected me. I was the only one nominated. And the, the coach, my coach, went to the girls and said, Howard cannot be the athletic king. <coughs> Howard, well, among other things, is nothing but a drunk. Jesus, that didn't get him a lawsuit today. But uh, uh, and then, then they had another election, and I was the only one nominated. And, uh, and so the superintendent of the school says, we aren't having an athletic king. You know who the athletic queen was? Yes, that's right. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, not very long ago, all our kids were over, and they were going through, Pat's sister was visiting us, and they were going through old photographs, and there's a picture of Pat being crowned as uh, athletic queen. And there wasn't any athletic king. So my kids want pictures of their mom as the athletic king, and they come and send them out to their kids, and it's a, you know, and I could tell that story, I did, you know, to this 17-year-old and say, now, this was what, you know, this was what happened to me. Now, within that same year, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous in Sumner County, Kansas, had came to me and said, little Polly, why don't you go to an AA meeting with me? And I said, sure, Bill. What for? <laughs> he had the body and fender shop, and I had just busted up my 39 Ford Coupe for the third time in a couple of three months, and I was drunk each time. It wasn't really my fault. <laughs> in this little town, they put the fire plugs too close to the curb. <laughs> 
So when you pull in to your, put your wheels on the curb, you knock out a headlight. I mean, you should, I should have sued him. And uh, anyway, I could not believe. Now, up until then, I gave Bill Bringer a lot of credit for having some kind of insight into alcoholism and alcoholics. But boy, he lost his credibility right there. Okay, and then I had more and more and more headlights to knock out and people to hurt and things to do. That if we, we need to, I think I need to tell those stories simply because Bill Wilson said in uh, the 12 and 12, we need to lift the bottom. We need to raise our bottom so that the new people can see they don't have to end up candidates for hard time in the federal penitentiary like some of us did. They, they can, now, if we just get them that information and they go ahead and drink, at least they're going to say, well, <laughs> he was right. You know, Bill was right. I knocked out another headlight. Uh, so anyway, I came to AA and I was gradually learning about alcoholism. And uh, I did stop drinking. I got drunk one more time. I, was, I came in on Monday. I got drunk the next Monday night. And then I came back Friday. And I haven't had a drink. That was August the 4th, 1972. And I haven't had a drink since then. And uh, haven't wanted one. That four days taught me all I ever need to know. You know, it was like a recent forgiveness experience I had that took a year and a half and one afternoon for me to forgive these people. <laughs> you guess how long it could have been. Uh, I, uh, so I came to the meetings and I heard and then I, I, I saw I need to work the steps. I cannot believe this program will not work unless I work the steps. I know that's when I came to. I didn't know that that was what happened, but that was when I came to. And I worked the first step. Well, I worked the first part of the first step. And then I skipped the second. Now, I skipped the second, not really. I believed in God, but I did. I believed what the deists believe. And that is that God has created the universe with immutable laws so that everything unfolds in accordance with the immutable laws. It's all predetermined and uh, uh, it doesn't accommodate you and, and there is no spiritual insight. Insight is the human intellect. And I believe that stuff. And I told my sponsor, that's what I believe. And, and uh, he said, well, how's that working for? I said, working fine for me. And so that's also my third step. But then I did a fourth step. And uh, my dad was a prominent, I was a battered child. My dad was an alcoholic. He beat me way the hell. He just beat me three times really bad but they were way too bad. Either one of them, any one of them would have been a trauma. And dad had a seventh grade education, so you know how the word trauma would have influenced him. He knew I didn't do what he, he either told me not to do and I did it, or he decided I should have known. <laughs> and that I'd know by God the next time. And uh, you get you get beaten, and uh, uh, I did, and uh, uh, I. Uh, he was also an alcoholic. In 1946, on July the sixth, he and Bill Bringer, Bill Bringer took him to Wichita, and he went to AA, and he got sober. My dad did, but my dad. Like many people back there in the Bible land, uh, was a Mason. 
I'm a, a member of the Masonic Lodge, and everything is very esoteric. You know, it's all secret. Well, that's the way he looked on AA. Anonymous meant secret to him. And uh, he was all, you know, it was, it was, I didn't know what the hell was going on in the other room. Uh, the wives with mother were sitting out in the kitchen, but uh, in the other room, there was secret shit going on. And, uh, and that was all I knew, and that dad was sober, but he was still angry. But I knew he was also active in AA. And, uh, and then I went off to the service and, and uh, uh, after the Korean War started, and, and then di dad died at an AA meeting, sober. Uh, he had gotten drunk one time after July, but uh, that was after a year of sobriety, and it was for one weekend, and then he didn't drink for the rest of his life. And he died sober at an AA meeting. Now, I end up in AA, and I'm doing my inventory, and Dad is a tall pole in the tent in terms of resentment. Every, and he's in my mind all the time. Anytime anything goes wrong. How many of you have ever written a Fortran program for a computer? There we go, see? There's a little statement in the program where it says, go to. If something happens, you go to. <laughs> it's my dad's fault. And, and you're mad at him. You see, and it just every time this is greater than that, I go to dad. I mean, that's the way I was programmed. That's the way I lived my life. Dad died at a sober meeting in, in, in 1951, March the 8th, 1951. This was 1973. And my mind is still doing that. And uh, I list these things. And then I, don't know why, but I read the book. And it has what, <laughs> it has what uh, some people in Texas in the primary purpose group call the sick man's prayer. And, <laughs> and uh, what you do is you look at this resentment and the person you resent and you became conscious of the truth that he, like you, was perhaps spiritually sick. What was his sickness? Well, his sickness was he based his sense of well-being on his kids behaving so that they would mount to something, so that they would not have a seventh grade education, but a high school education, perhaps a college degree. That was what, and I was the sixth kid in eight years. And, uh, and I wasn't looking good, and none of the others had me, you know. So I uh, just whipped him into shape. And, and I saw that he, like me, just wanted to have his way. And all he knew was, was to manage it well. And all he knew about managing was to whip the hell out of you. And, uh, uh, and I was, now, I also had some exposure to an archive, which I wish every group in AA would prepare, and that they were always available when you come to a group. And that's a history of the group written by the people and added to it each year of the activities of that group. Uh, because I saw my dad, and he was in that big time. Now, he got sober in 46, and the traditions come out in 46. And I don't think dad really got big time into the step, but he sure did in the traditions. And he's not only mentioned in the Argonia, Kansas archives, which they've lost, but in every meeting they got started in Sumner County back in the, in the 40s and, and early 50s. My dad was part of that. And, and so giving him patience, giving him tolerance, giving him kindness, giving him uh, compassion, 
those things were easy to give. And uh, I did it, and, uh, and it, had, it changed my life. My dad was no longer in my head. And when he was in my head, it was no longer with me resenting him. Now, you and I know that that sets off bumps, <laughs> you know. And I don't care the first time I went through the steps, if all I got, and it wasn't all I got, what, all I got the first time through the steps were the tall poles in the tent. I got identified and got rid of the major resentment. And... Uh, uh, made a huge difference in my life. Now, Pat's going to Al-Anon, and uh, I don't know what they're doing in Al-Anon, and it kind of worries me, but, but uh, <laughs> things haven't gotten bad yet. <laughs> and believe it or not, in the fall of 1974, when I have a little over two years, uh, the Southern California AA Convention Committee had decided to add a Saturday night speaker for midnight, and it would be people with less than five years sobriety. And I was asked to be the speaker at that meeting with less than three years. But I, I did it. Now, the trick about that is you can't do it unless somebody asks you. And I don't know what the hell prompts them to ask. They just ask. But then you have a tape. And the tape gets sent. You know, people will call the taper and say, you have somebody new. So I start getting invited to speak. And, uh, and I'm taking Pat with me. And, and I take her to... Uh, Bakersfield. I take her to a lot of places, and I take her to Fresno. Now, that's an all-night, I mean, that's a get-up Saturday morning and drive all day to Fresno. Check into a motel where they're paying for you, you see. And then you have dinner, and you get to be the speaker. And uh, this is a big deal. And then you get up, and you see Fresno. You get to see the high spots in Fresno on Sunday morning. <laughs> and then we drove home. Next year, I get an invitation to go to Fresno. I say, hey, Pat, we're going to Fresno. She says, I don't want to go to Fresno. <laughs> Pat, you know how much fun we had. She said, Fresno, we had fun, Howard, but it's just good for one fun time. <laughs> People in Fresno never have fun twice, he says. <laughs> I said, okay, you said your little joke. Now, we're going to Fresno. No doubt in my mind that she's going to Fresno. No doubt in my mind that her current position is one of negotiating for a better deal than she has now, and that I will negotiate with her, and I'll make a better deal. Because way back in the back of my mind, I know when I have to pay off, I'm going to renegotiate. Because I ain't going to give her the big deal. But uh, I don't really know that's the way I am. I'll tell you how you find out. Don't forget we're going to Fresno Saturday. I'm not going to Fresno. I said, ah, come on now. You know, we had such a good time. And... And then they, they would help each other, and I would like for you to go. And she said, Howard, I love you, and we're going to be together forever. And if it causes you pain for me not to go to Fresno with you, I want you to know I love you enough to help you go through the pain. <laughs> But that's how much I love you. <laughs> so we started over again. And uh, I did the first part of the first step. 
I fully conceded to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic. Frank, along about this time, I was telling everybody, I don't pray. We don't need to pray. God don't have ears. Hey, you know God created the universe? You know what a big deal that is? What knowledge do I have that's going to add to what knowledge God had to do that? you got to be kidding me. And uh, Frank said, well, when I told him, I mean, if I told you, you wouldn't care. You're just trying to tell me about how you pray and go on about your day. But Frank said, well, I didn't learn to pray until I learned to meditate. And uh, <laughs> that, you know, and so I read uh, 12 and 12, and that's nothing but uh, St. Francis of Assisi, and uh, I ain't going to do that. And Frank said, well, there's more to it than that. And, uh, and he taught me, that at least as a starting point, meditation is being conscious of what you want to be conscious of. If you guys are listening to me and are conscious of the meaning of the words, and are listening to each phrase and idea, then you're meditating. And if at the end of the meditation you're conscious, let's say we were describing the alcoholic. Alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control their drinking. Got that? The loss of control is characterized by an insane, obsessive belief each time we start to drink that somehow, some way, this time, it's going to be different. This time, I'm going to control and enjoy my drinking. Coupled with that is a physical reaction to alcohol that manifests itself in the phenomenon of craving for more once I start to drink. We are restless, irritable, and discontented until we can once again experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes from taking a few drinks. Drinks which our insane obsession convinces us we can take with impunity. And when we succumb, as we always did, and the phenomenon of craving develops, we go through the well-known stages of a spree emerging full of remorse with a firm resolve never to do that again. And we do it again and again and again. And over any considerable period of time, it gets worse. It never gets better, which leads in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. If you were conscious of that as we were going through that description, and if at the end you were aware that that is a very good description of your experience, then you can fully concede to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic. And if you do that in depth every morning before you start the day, and then at the end, I said, you know, I said, what, what about a prayer? And he said, well, if you just sit there and be aware of how your life has changed since you stopped drinking. And, uh, and then if you just become a little aware of what little you had to do with those changes, you may get a good feeling. And we'll call that good feeling gratitude. Now, one prayer would be to say, thank you, thank you, God. We said, I don't want you to do that. If you have a good, he said, this isn't a podium, and it's not a podium, it's a lectern. This is not a table. That is not a pitcher of water, because lectern, table, pitcher of water, those are words. Those things aren't words. They're whatever they are, but they're not words. Thank you, God, is not gratitude. If you're feeling grateful, just let that feeling be your prayer. <laughs> and, and that somehow puts pleasure into it, you know? 
for if we're actually doing that. And, and gratitude is defined in the dictionary as something like a good feeling because something bad was taken away or something good was added to your life. And if you become conscious of that and know that it's happened and know you didn't do it, or at least you had a lot of help, you will feel grateful. Uh, and the pleasure center will kick on and you will have done the first part of the first step. Now we're into Pat and uh, the second part of the first step where she uh, uh, my sponsor uh, okay first part we admitted we were powerless over alcohol second part that our lives had become unmanageable. When we fully concede to our innermost selves that we are alcoholic, that is the first step in recovery. But alcohol is only a symptom of a deeper problem. What is the deeper problem? Selfishness and self-centered, that we think is the root of our problem. We have become like the actor who has to run the whole show. The lights, the ballet, setting the stage, control the dialogue, don't you say what I don't want you to say, or your actions. Now, I am not doing this, I don't think, because I'm selfish. I'm doing it because I love her so much. And I know if she will just do what I want her to do, she will be happy. I will be happy. This is not, to me, selfishness. Selfishness is when I don't care about her, and I care very much, so I know I'm not selfish and self-centered. I'm just the last of the good guys, and, uh, and she has no appreciation for me, so I've got to work harder to get her to do this. And, and, uh, and she's getting more resistant. And the book said, I become self-pitying and angry. What is his basic trouble? Is he not a victim of the delusion, an insane idea? Is he not the victim of a delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages her well? <laughs> My partner says, take a look at that. You know, and you hear this all the time, and it ticks, ticks you off every time. How's that working for you? So I have to fully concede to my innermost self that I lack the power to get her to do what I want her to do. And I think there's a third part to the, I think there's a third part to the first step. And uh, I've, I've run on and on, so I'm running out of time. But just to make up a page number, <laughs> and I ain't going to make it easy for you this time, pages 352 to 354 in the back of the book, Bill W., Pass It On. Whereas the big book, written in 1938, radiates Bill's joy and gratitude at having finally found a way to stay sober, the 12 and 12 reflects an entirely different mood. In 1951 and 1952, when Bill wrote his second book, he was suffering almost constant depression and was forced to confront the emotional and spiritual demons that remained stranded in the alcoholic psyche when the high tide of active alcoholism has receded. The 12 and 12 provides a highly practical and profoundly spiritual prescription to help exorcise those demons. The problem of the steps Bill wrote in a memo to Father Dowling dated 1917, July 17, 1952, the problem of the steps has been to broaden 
and deepen them, both for the newcomers and old timers alike. How to widen the opening so it seems right and reasonable to enter there and at the same time avoid distractions like the first 164 pages of the big book is all I need. That's a distraction from what Bill is talking about, broadening and deepening the steps in our lives for the old timers and the newcomers alike. And I know everybody doesn't end up angry, you know, with, where, where they're anxious and angry and depressed and filled with dread about their lives long after the high tide of active alcoholism receded. But I was. <laughs> and this was a big help to me. But, but hell, that book didn't come out until 1984, and I've been sober, what, 12 years then? And, uh, uh, and, and I read this, and of course, I'm distracted. Because I know all I need is the first 164 pages, and I know that Joe and Charlie taught me how to do this. I know. I'm all, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, I'll look at I'll look, I'll check it out. And I look in uh, 12 and 12, and it took me till the second sentence to run into something that had bothered me all the time, but I'd never even given any thought. And that was none of us like to admit that we are uh, personally powerless it's on the first page of the first step. Well, I don't like to admit that I'm personally powerless because I'm not. Yeah. And back by this time, I'm, uh, I'm doing the meditation thing well enough so that when I am distracted, or doubtful about something. I set time that evening for meditation to be conscious to meditate on that. And now I'm conscious that I doubt that Bill was successful in his efforts to go deeper and broader into the steps than he did in the big book. I doubt that. And I doubt that I am personally powerless. I don't care if three paragraphs later he says our admissions of our personal powerlessness becomes firm bedrock upon which we can build happy, productive life. I doubt that. And in my meditation then, I just let's see what comes up. And what comes up is trying to get weight out of the Apache and I was, I was working on the Apache helicopter, and it was a place in the design where you try to keep uh, performance in but taking weight out. And, and it's not an easy time in their life. The engineers don't have easy times in their life. And <laughs> uh, but you see, I know that, for example, the electromagnetic force, uh, where it's a uh, uh, an electron is attracted to a proton at a force 10 to the 37th power. That's a 1 followed by 37 zeros. For an electron, it's a minus 1 to 37 zeros. To a proton, it's a plus 1 to 37 zeros. You bond those together, and that's a zero. And it ain't close to a zero. It is a zero because gravity has a value of one. If these others have 10 to the trillions and trillions and trillions of time, gravity has one. And they are so finely distributed and the, 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 the forces balance so well that gravity is the dominating force between the Apache helicopter and the Earth and between my body and the Earth. That's how perfect it is. And if one is trouble for me, <laughs> I can't have much power. My timer goes off and my head says, yeah, but you have some power. <laughs> you had the power to decide to pick up this big book. And having decided to pick up this big book, you have the power to pick it up. Now, you don't have much power, but you're not personally powerless. It comes to me, yeah, that's right. <laughs> now pick it up with your vision. 
Don't touch it with your hands. Just wrap your vision around it and levitate it up. Well, I can't do that. Well, give yourself the power to do that. Well, I can't get I'm dumb enough to try. <laughs> but I can't give myself that power. No, and you didn't give yourself the power to decide to pick it up with your hands, and you did not give yourself the power to pick it up with your hands because you are personally powerless. And whatever power you have has to come from some other source of power. You and I cannot give ourselves power any more than a rock can give itself power. And it's trillions and trillions and trillions. Anyway, it's a perfectly distributed uh, uh, particles and balance in the forces of nature, which you have absolutely nothing to do with, yet it puts stability in my life. Of myself, I'm personally powerless, which is a tremendous bedrock upon which we can start. Well, there's still got five minutes, but there is a basis for looking into the second step. My knowledge that I lack the power over alcohol, I'm powerless over alcohol. Lack of power over Pat is my dilemma. <laughs> but that I am personally powerless. Now, when I look then at the second step, for a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, having all powerful, how much more is there than all powerful? Guiding creative intelligence, manifesting precise law, order, harmony in every aspect of all being. I need to have, for me, I need to have that firm bedrock of my powerlessness before I can really seek this power greater than myself. Uh, Let's stop two minutes before the time is, and then we will catch up right after lunch. We're going to catch up the steps back back. And then back to a four, and then up to a five, and back to a damn three again. And, um, but these are changes that shut off Okay, if you make a list of all the people that you resent and you actually forgive them, each one of those represents shutting off a certain number of transmitters that activate the fight or flight center. Those things get shut down. And the pleasure center has a better chance of opening up. Each of these things in the steps address our bodily and mental differences from our fellows. And as long as we stay here, my observation, and I haven't checked this with my senior over here, <laughs> Stan, but my observation is if you stop doing, stop doing stuff and start cutting corners, which I know I have done, start cutting corners, uh, then pretty soon you can be right back where you were. You know, the pumps start, you, you never lose the pumps that don't look like. And if you don't do the things that keep them shut down, then they're going to start back up again and it's fight or flight, it's win the competition. I have to be right here. And uh, that, but as, if we just keep this other thing going, uh, I think in the face of my lovely wife having three strokes since August uh, 2012 and going blind, we have had 
over that period of time some of the best times and best parts of our 60 years together. Why? Because we looked for the best part instead of looking for what the hell we didn't want. Not much was happening that we wanted to happen without us wanting to find the goodness in what was happening. That takes, you know, that's just a miracle to me. Uh, uh, Paul last night mentioned, what's a miracle? Well, to me, that's a miracle. That's a wonderful thing. So I'm going to stop just to give you some optimism that I stopped a few minutes before the whistle blows. And, uh, and then the rest of the talk is more interesting than this part. <laughs> Trust me on that. I love you guys. Thank you. My name is Howard, and I am an alcoholic. My home group is called the Wadi Group, which is short for We Ain't Dead Yet. Uh, I'm the only one that that applies to. Mostly it's young people, but nevertheless, that's the name of our group. My sobriety dates August 4th, 1972. Uh, so, uh, a year behind the tsunami of spirituality that came in in 71. Uh, so, in the first step, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, and we did that by having, from the big book, an understanding in depth of what an alcoholic is and what alcoholism is. And with that, we could fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. Similarly, when we looked at the problems we have in life, just the day-to-day -day problems, we saw how frequently, in fact, nearly always, it was simply a matter of me not having my way. That's the only problem I had ever had was I was not having my way. And uh, <laughs> uh, I needed to see that, and it's remarkable how I don't see it. How it isn't, that isn't the problem. The problem is you won't give me my way. That's the problem. And uh, I just, so. And then finally, I believe that Bill, when he wrote the 12 and 12, uh, emphasized, he saw the need, I think, to emphasize not only that I'm powerless over alcohol, not only is lack of power to control my life, my dilemma, but I am personally powerless. Personally, I have no power. Whatever power I have has to come from some other source of power. And uh, gradually, as I learned that, then uh, uh, it, the, the question uh, is, how do you find this power greater than yourself that can help you. Now, uh, you guys know, have you, how many of you have read the book, uh, A New Pair of Glasses? Oh, okay. Well, if you've read, you now everybody, I think, I think that uh, we find, we, we each with our sponsors help find our way through the program with the steps. We find our way into and through the steps. Now, I can't tell you the page on the new pair of glasses. You start with, there's a series of printings, and each one has a different page number, and they change the page numbers. But uh, one of the things Chuck talks about in uh, the first chapter uh, of that book was that one of the things he said is, why is that back here in chapter three? 
this is program stuff back here in chapter 3. Why isn't that up here in 5, which describes the program? Now, I'm telling you, there's a world of Los Angeles AA in that statement. <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, it's very easy. Admissions, uh, the step one is two admissions of my power, uh, of my unmanageability of my life. And step two is my insanity. I discovered my insanity. He said that twice in that uh, chapter. Listen, he was the most spiritual guy I have met. Uh, but, but it seems to me that in the first step, I fully concede to my innermost self that I have an insane delusion and that I am a victim of the insane delusion. I have the insane obsession and the insane delusion. And that's in the first step. And if I haven't found my insanity in the first step, then I haven't taken it. When I get to the second step, I find my solution. I'm looking for the power greater than myself that can restore me to sanity. I've already admitted that I'm insane. And uh, that's the way I came to believe it, and that was the way I was taught, you see. And, and um, I was taught that way because Pat wouldn't cave in. You know, she did for a long, long time. And, uh, and the fact is, we weren't that happy. And the fact is, as soon as she stopped caving in and said, uh, uh, I love you enough to help you go through the pain, but you go through the pain because I ain't going to Fresno. Uh, well, that's not a problem. You know, I didn't have my way. I'm, I'm big hearted about that. And I got Bud Proctor, a guy I sponsored, uh, who got drunk and drank himself to death. But at the time, I got Bud, and we had a tremendous time going up to Fresno with me talking to him all the time. And when we got up there, I talked to him some more. And then I talked at the meeting, and then I talked all the way back. And and uh, it was a hell of a good time for me, and, and I'm sure Bud learned a lot. That's why he slipped. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the thing is, Pat had changed. I mean, now it was, if she didn't want to do it, it was no. And I said, now come on, let's reason together. And she said, I'll be glad to listen to your reasons, but your reasons are always better than mine. And I only have one reason, and that is, I am not going to do this. <laughs> My sponsor tells me that no, is a complete answer. <laughs> oh. So I say to my sponsor, she has become unreasonable. <laughs> and he said, it sounds like it's time for the steps. And I said, I know it, but I don't think she's ever done them. <laughs> I could not believe. Now, this sponsor was an actor. And the thought that goes through my head with him is, what in the hell am I doing with an actor for a president? I mean, for a sponsor. <laughs> I thought that about other, pre other presidents, too. But <laughs> now, we won't get into President Reagan. Uh, but why do I have this actor? He doesn't know anything about alcoholism, and all he knows is work the steps, and he just says that because he doesn't know anything else. This isn't going to address my problem. It's clearly she had become unreasonable. Now, I, I, uh, we just went through uh, that part of the first step so that enough times, you know, so he would say, well, how are you doing with that? How's that working for you? And, 
And so just gradually I, I surrendered that I lacked the power to, con and then I'm looking for a higher power. And uh, I'm reading the book, and in the book it says, with any luck, we'll find this. Bill W. had made frequent reference to the big book, to the value of religion for those in the program who have religious connections or interests. Page nine, they had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. Page 158, there were a deeply religious people much shocked by their son's refusal to have anything to do with the church. Page 11, it began to look as though religious people were right after all. It wasn't really beginning to look that way for me, but Bill's encouraging about it anyway. These having religious, those having religious affiliations will find here nothing disturbing to their beliefs or ceremony. Page 28, not all of us join religious bodies, but most of us favor such memberships. Though not a religious person, I have profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. It's expressed to somebody on page 43. But later, alone in his room, he asked himself this question. Is it possible that all religious people I have known are wrong? Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with someone ordained by established religion. Be quick to see where religious people are right. We represent no particular faith or denomination. We are dealing only with general principles common to most denominations. On page 93, 94, there is all the way through the big book, frequent referrals to the value that we will find if we look for it in religion. Now, I may, I, I may have read each one of those real fast, and, and it's possible to do this stuff by the book but not be connected. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that happens a lot with me, and I never connected much with religion. And uh, when I was young, Anyway, when I got out of the Navy, um, I, had, I had written Pat and said, I love you, no, and, then, and then I had written and said, I would like for you to marry me, but I'm taking instructions in the Catholic Church, so if you will marry me, we will get married in the Catholic Church. And then we will have children and they will be raised Catholic, if you say yes to me. <laughs> Which meant, if she said no, it wasn't to me, it was to the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, now, I honestly did not think of those things, but, but always, that's the, my motivation for me to have my way and me to protect myself. I was always in that mode. She, much to my surprise, wrote me back and said, I do love you and I would love to marry you and I would love to have your children, but I will not marry you in the Catholic Church and my children will not be raised in the Catholic Church. <laughs> I think my interest in being a Catholic ended right there. <laughs> I mean, it was very, very important to me right up till then. <laughs> and I wasn't sure that maybe someday I wouldn't turn her minds on this because, and my sister, who, who uh, was a member of the Church of Christ. Now, I don't know much about them except they are hard over for Jesus. And, 
and uh, their reading of the Bible. And, and that was fine with me. And she said, well, now that you're not going to be a Catholic, do you want to look at a real Christian religion? <laughs> and I said, Marjorie, if I was going to be a Christian, I would be a Catholic. But uh, I don't believe that God actually exists in this universe. And, uh, and, and uh, she said, oh, I knew you'd be an atheist. You're studying science. All scientists are atheists. And hell, I'm not studying anything, really. I'm taking some classes, but I ain't studying anything. And, and I said, uh, she said, look at Dr. Einstein. Well, now I'm impressed. She does not know that. But I, I, and I have no idea what Dr. Einstein knew. I just know you cannot know that. <laughs> it's impossible for a human mind to know the things that he not only knew, but which have been tested and proven eight decimal points out. Time and time again, it's just amazing what this guy knew. So if he's an atheist, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> and so I get a little book, which you can get at any bookstore now. I think it's called uh, uh, Life as I See It by Albert Einstein. Life as I See It. And uh, in there he says that he talks about different religious levels, different levels of religious experience. The first is one engendered by fear. And the next one is engendered by morality. But there's a third level of religious experience, which he calls a cosmic religious experience, where the individual, now think about our steps while we're doing this. The individual feels the nothingness of human desires and names and feels the sublimity and marvelous order that reveal themselves both in nature and in the world of thought. He looks on his individual existence as sort of a prison and wants to experience the universe in a single significant whole. Um, and I read that and I think, well, if he believes that, I'm going to believe it too. And, and, and then, when I'm looking for God, uh, and I've learned to meditate, and I'm having, I'm having experiences in my life which are very clear to me that they are not intellectual experiences that I have because my mind is calm. These are experiences which I cannot do or think of. Ideas that come to me that I've never been exposed to. And you can call it intuition or whatever, but, but it's something that's coming from something other than me that enriches my life. And I'm having these experiences. And so I, uh, uh, I, and, and, I, and then I had a meditative experience, which if I have time when we get to to that, I'll tell you the whole experience, but the fact is I became willing to, the big book says on page 48, the bottom of 48, top of 49, the prosaic steel girder is made up of electrons whirling around each other at incredible speeds and in accordance with precise law. If you read a high school or early physics book in college, they describe electrons basically as whirling around protons. Seldom, now they do whirl around electrons, I know that, but that didn't seem to me to be a great way of explaining electrons, and that was all I thought about when I would read what Bill wrote. My mind just disavowed whatever the hell was going on that I hadn't invented, and I hadn't invented much. And, and uh, 
But this time, I read it. And it says, in accordance with precise law. These laws hold true throughout the material world. Well, again, Dr. Einstein, somebody said, do you believe in God? He said, I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the lawful harmony of everything that exists. Read Bill Wilson, and he said, in everything or nothing. And uh, Dr. Einstein said, anyone who has been in thorough pursuit of science has bec had become convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man and one in the face of which we with our modest powers must be absolutely humble. But the fact is this guy's talking about a spirit manifesting lawful harmony in everything that exists. And that just sounds so much like the big book that it's in. And if you look at science, like I talked about earlier, uh, Every massive body in the universe is made up that is stable. Every massive body that is stable uh, is made up of a perfect distribution of particles and a perfect balance in the forces of nature. How big a deal is that? Well, it's a big enough deal that every massive body has a gravitational attraction to every other massive body in the entire universe, which holds it together as a single significant whole. And if we want to be conscious of it at the time, we are a part of that. And that is such a much greater experience than that of me, isolated, and separate from everything. Mr. Chamberlain used to say that uh, there's only one problem, and it includes all problems. And there is only one solution, it includes all solutions. Now, I said that's obviously oversimplification, but it's what I believe. And that one problem is a conscious feeling of separation from God. If you're having a problem, you are having a conscious feeling of separation from God. And the one solution that includes all solutions is a conscious feeling of unity with God. Then he adds, in my opinion, none of us can enjoy that one solution and includes all solutions, and either alcoholic or non-alcoholic, unless they have a personally satisfactory conscious partnership with the God that made you in this entire business of living. Now, if, you just, if you've learned to meditate and you just spend some time being conscious of your connectedness with the universe, not just gravitationally, but the fact on a bright, if you go in the north rim of the Grand Canyon where you can always come and spend some money, uh, and the, on the darkest night in the clearest sky, you can look up and you can see well, a, a, a star we call Andromeda, which is not a star at all, but our nearest galaxy. That is two million light years away. The light that comes from Andromeda and enters the people's eye on the north rim of the Grand Canyon tonight started over two million years ago. And here this brand new, comparatively, brand new eye is principally interactive with the biochemistry and the physics in the properties of light 
so that my eye is principally interactive with it and I can see it. Now that's kind of a hint of a possible existence <laughs> of a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. Manifesting order, harmony, and unfolding goodness. And then if you put the Hubble telescope in there, and you can get this one on the internet today, light coming from 13 billion light years away is principally interactive with your vision. Uh, no big deal, but that's a big deal. <laughs> and if we're conscious, we know that, now, Bill Wilson slips it to us, always, on page 49, when he says, <laughs> the logical assumption is that underneath the material world, now this is the subtlety then, Nick, underneath the material world and life as we see it, there's an all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence. 